Okay, class, so this is the first lecture um, uh, that I couldn't actually record yesterday, but I'm going to do it today. So everybody by now hopefully knows how to log into Canvas. Go to macecc.edu and then click on Canvas, or you can go directly there from uh, maricopa.instructure.com, which is right here. Uh, I'm just going to use 32410 as an example. So once you get there, if you want to uh, follow along with the lecture, you can download the PowerPoints here um, for Chapter 1, which I'm going to do now. You can, if you don't have Office, you can get Office if you just go to mesacc.edusupportcenter.com and then uh, do a search for Office and you'll take you to Microsoft Office for students and employees. So there's a licensing agreement with Microsoft that all students that are enrolled in classes at MCC have access to Microsoft Office 365. And if you click on this link, it'll show you how to download it, how to install it for Windows, or how to install it for a Mac. Um, again, you can't use a Chromebook here. Uh, there's no um, ability to run the software on a Chromebook. So uh, anyway. Uh, for that, you would need uh, to use the Google uh, Office instead of Microsoft Office. But I'm using Microsoft Office, uh, and I think Google can convert this, but however you want to view it, it's fine with me. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the PowerPoints. Um, so we're going to start off this class uh, talking about what uh, biology. So the purpose of this class, Bio 181, is to give you an overview of it, biological systems on a small scale. So we're going to start off uh, talking about um, how we define life, what, uh, how we classify life, how we study life, how we do experiments in uh, a laboratory setting, and then we're going to start talking about uh, the chemistry that allows life to exist. So we're not going to get into the hardcore chemistry, but we will talk just enough chemistry in order to understand how living systems work. Um, and then from there, we're going to we'll go, we'll build up to a little bigger to the cell, how the cell functions, the parts of the cell. Um, and then we're going to move, we'll move on to uh, how cells divide, how we grow, what causes cancer, um, our genetics, our DNA, how our DNA is read into proteins that make us what we are. And I'll, as I go along, I'll try to give real world examples so that you'll really see what the purpose of learning all this stuff is. And it's not just a bunch of junk that you're forced to learn. Um, you really will use this, uh, particularly if you go into um, uh, medicine or anything to do with medicine. Um, I'm recording downstairs, so you might hear my one-year-old crying or watching TV or whatever. Um, I'm going to move upstairs. I just have to update the drivers on my computer, so uh, just bear with me for this one lecture. Um, and I'm going to just make sure that my whiteboard works here so I can do my draw. Okay, so I'm just going to draw on the slides here. If I have anything to write, I'll just write it off to the side. All right, so... Uh, we need, in order for us to um, even talk about biology, so again, the the roots of these words come from Greek and Latin, and uh, bios is uh, life and ology is to study, so biology literally is the study of life. Now, that may seem straightforward, but what I want you to do to begin this class is to think about what is life? How do you define life? If someone came to you, like your mother or whatever, and knew nothing about this class, how would you tell them what you're actually studying? You know, what is life? And this is really relevant because if we are looking at um, we're looking at actually traveling to um, pl other planets or other moons of other planets. One promising planet is Europa, 
And Europa is interesting because it actually has uh, a, a watery shell. And we know that because we sift probes to it. Um, and you can kind of, if you uh, look at uh, Wikipedia and things like that, you can kind of get an idea of what we're talking about. But this moon right here, um, you can see all the cracks in it. Those are actually uh, cracks in the ice. So this is covered in, in ice. And underneath there is a liquid ocean. Now, we know uh, that because uh, physics of the universe is just the same as physics on Earth. So if it happens on Earth, it happens on other planets as well. And so if you just think about something like Antarctica, which is uh, frozen ice, you know, there is some land, but it's mostly ice. Uh, there's a, a station there called Vostok. Um, and the story behind Vostok is, is that... Uh, Everyone knows the United States beat the Soviet Union to the moon. Well, the Soviet Union was kind of pissed off about that. And so what they decided to do is go uh, and since they couldn't beat us to the moon, they were going to beat us to the South Pole. So they went there and they set up a camp at a place called Vostok. Um, So this is what it looks like. It's, it's pretty barren, as you can see. Um, it actually has the coldest measured temperature on planet Earth. But what's interesting, so anyway, so the Soviet Union set up this station uh, in, at Vostok in Antarctica. And uh, then they put their flag on it and they said, okay, we, we claim the South Pole for the Soviet Union. What they didn't think about is that they had actually planted um, their flag at the magnetic South Pole rather than the geographic South Pole. And what they didn't think about is that the Earth's core is metal and it rotates and that changes the magnetic field. And so after they had built this station, the magnetic field changed and it would continue to change so the united states being sort of uh keen to their mistake they built a station on the geographic south pole so they beat them to the south pole and to the moon at the same time the russians were really mad about that um uh, and they wasted all this money building the station but one good thing that came out of this is that they discovered a lake underneath this station and that lake is called Lake Vostok. And so Lake Vostok is uh, a subglacial lake. Um, it is about uh, 1600 feet below the surface of Antarctica. So that's roughly a quarter mile, um, and the and the Russians uh, actually uh, were have been drilling in this for quite a long time. Um, you can see that at some places the ice is one point two two uh, thousand meters, one point two miles thick. Some places it's thinner. So the the Russian and this is showing you where it is. The Russians are drilling through this ice. Or were um, to actually um, see if life uh, it exists underneath all of this ice. And what's the purpose of this? Well, the purpose of this is uh, that if, again, if we can do it on Earth, if life can exist under, uh, you know, a mile of ice uh, in liquid water underneath there, then maybe it could live on a moon of Jupiter. And so uh, they did it. They drilled through it. I think they got through in uh, 1997. 
I think there's actually a picture of Vladimir Putin drinking Vostok water while riding bare chested on a horse. And so, anyway, uh, here's uh, the proof that that uh, Putin, and I wish there's a pictures here, but he uh, he actually drinks the water. Uh, we don't know what kind of bacteria or viruses are in there, but he went ahead and did it anyway, and he's still alive. So, uh, anyway, that's the story behind Vostok and Europa, and uh, there actually is going to be a Europa mission. Uh, I'm not sure when this is going down, but... Um, And so this is recent. This is just um, from last week. But there's been plans for this for quite a while. Um, I'm not sure if they have the funding for this or not. But uh, they want to send a probe to Europa to look for life. And essentially the plan behind this is, is that they're going to... Um, have a nuclear uh, head on this probe it's going to land on the icy surface it's going to radiate heat just like a nuclear reactor would it's going to melt through the ice and then i think you know they're going to try to find the the thinnest part of the ice on europa um, and this has a lot to do with the rotation and how much radiation it gets from jupiter because that heats up part of it but anyway, regardless, it's a, it's a, going to be a few miles thick. So they're going to send this probe in there and that probe is going to look for life. So this is going to cost billions of dollars. And when you think about all the money that's going to be spent on sending this probe to look for life, what's the most important part of this whole mission? And that is what is life? If this thing runs into a living creature, how is it going to know it? How is it going to uh, send a signal back to Earth saying uh, that there's life on Europa? And how big would that news be if you woke up tomorrow and they found life on the a moon of Jupiter? That would be major news. So this is a big deal. And this is why it's really important to be able to define what life is. Uh, there are jobs. Uh, astrobiologist, uh, you know, they make over $100,000 a year, and their sole purpose is to program these probes to look for life on other planets. All right. So, what is life? We talked about bios is life, and ology means to study, study of life. And as we go through this class, uh, there's going to be a lot of Greek and Latin terms that I'm going to go over. Um, you know, you probably know that these are common in, in medicine and definitely in science. Uh, you know, whenever you're watching like your hospital show, you always see them yelling at the word stat. Well, that's Latin for statum, which means right away. So you don't ever see them say, can I get that drug right away? They're always yelling stat, stat, stat. Well, that's really Latin. And, you know, a lot of you guys are going to take anatomy after this class and just let you know that that's a Latin word, too. Anna means up and uh, tomi uh, means to cut. So anatomy literally means to cut up. And that's what you'll be doing in that class. All right. Uh, so as biologists, what, what, uh, we need to know what life is, right? And how do we know? Uh, how do we distinguish what is alive from what isn't alive? So, just ask yourself some questions. Like, the this cathedral in Cologne, is it alive? 
And most of you would probably say no. Um, well, why not? But this baby chicken is alive. Well, most of you would say it is. And my question to you is, well, why? Why is this baby chicken alive? And why is this cathedral not alive? Um, and, you know, this is bacteria. Escherichia coli is a, a very common bacteria that's studied all the time. And hey, yeah, I'm going to pause this because I got to charge this computer. Okay. So, uh, Escherichia coli is a bacteria. Um, it was named after a physician. His name was Escherich. And he actually discovered this in people's colon. So that's where the word Escherichia coli comes from. We'll talk about, uh, and, and a lot of this is also Greek and Latin. And we'll talk about this, uh, later on when we get to taxonomy. Um, then we have the Hoover Dam, right? This thing, it, uh, took many years to complete. The, the rumors are several, many people died. There's rumors that they're buried in there, but I don't think there's any, uh, substantial evidence for that but this thing creates a lot of energy um, most of the almost all the energy that powers las vegas comes from the Hoover Dam. so is this alive most of you would say no right um the orion nebula is that alive most of you would say no maybe it harbors life karchner caverns it's interesting i actually went on a tour for karchner caverns and when i was in there they told me uh, that this cave was alive. And I was like, wait, what are you talking about? Uh, I never heard that before. And they said, yeah, it's alive. And I said, okay, well, what makes this cave alive versus a dead cave? And they said, it's because it's growing. So the first thing, the first thing that I heard about to define something that is alive, which is rocks, is that they grow. So, do you guys believe that Karchner Caverns is really alive? And my answer, my response to the National Park Service person was, hey, pal, your definition of life is way different than mine. Viruses, are they alive? There's a whole article that was written in Scientific American about this. Um, uh, and a lot of people would argue that viruses aren't alive and, or viruses are alive. And I think once we go through the, what actually the definitions of life are that most scientists accept, you'll see why it's so controversial whether or not viruses are alive or are they not. What about a butterfly? What makes this alive? What makes this questionable? What makes this safe that it's alive when it's really not? And these are all interesting questions. Uh, normally, I would have you guys uh, break out into groups and discuss this uh, so that you can meet other people in your classroom and things like that. Uh, but since we're doing this virtually, uh, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But um, what I want you to do is sort of take a minute and think about what life really is. What is the definition of life and obviously this is recorded so if you don't really want to think um, you can fast forward it but part of the process of the scientific method which we'll talk about later is that you in order for you to conduct an experiment you have to make observations uh, come up with questions and then form uh, educated guesses based on those questions um you do this all the time every day a uh, great example would be your car uh you're driving down the street and your car stops running so you would probably ask yourself well what happened to my car right uh and then you would start thinking about some of the things that could go wrong to cause your car to not continue to work and some of the basic things you probably know are, well, if it doesn't have electricity, if the battery's dead, that could make it not start. Um, maybe it's out of gas, right? So these are 
you know, any one of these could be a hypothesis. And then, you know, you would just pick one. So maybe you would pick, oh, it's out of gas. So then you would have to conduct an experiment to find out, is it out of gas? And it's pretty simple. You go and you, you formulate an experiment by buying gas and putting it in your car and seeing if it starts. And if it doesn't, then you'd move on to what we call an alternative hypothesis, which would be, hey, maybe the battery's dead. And so you would switch out the battery and then so on. And you'd keep going on like that. Um, you know, uh, in the old days, mechanics had to go through each of these different steps to try to figure out what was wrong with the car. Now they have computers in it and they throw codes that tell uh, mechanics what the issue probably is. Uh, so they can diagnose it and then and then they don't have to go through as many steps. Um, but you also have to remember that even the goal here is not to fix the car. The goal is to figure out what's wrong with it. So um, if you uh, change the battery and fill it with gas at the same time and then your car started, that's great. Now your car starts, but you don't know what the original problem was. So you can only uh, perform an experiment on one hypothesis at a time if you want to do discovery science, which is what uh, we're going to teach you how to do in this class. And hopefully, I mean, you realize that you do this every day anyway. All right, so what are the properties of light? Well, one is precise organization or order. And so, you know, we, we looked at the, the Cologne Cathedral. We looked at the Hoover Dam. I think we'd all agree that those are quite ordered. Uh, in living systems, order is very, very important. If, if uh, let's say that you... Um, were in the military or something like that, you know, and uh, you were shot at uh, in a foreign war and you got hit by several bullets. Well, those bullets have a chance to kill you. And the reason that they have a chance to kill you is because every time a bullet strikes you, it's, it's disordering your ordered system. So like your organs are ordered your brain has connections in it that's ordered um, but it doesn't have to be a, a, a bullet it could be cancer right so so cancer um, can cause disorder in a system too um, by moving around so let's say that you had uh, lung cancer and that generally spreads to your brain right so if you think about it, your lung cells have a specific purpose, right? They're to do oxygen exchange. And your brain cells, and that's only one eye, brain. Your brain cells have one purpose, and that purpose is to uh, create electrical signals uh, and form synapses and things like that. that we're not really going to get too in, into too much in this class, but... Um, you will talk about this when you get to anatomy and larger organ systems. So a simple question would be, in cancer, the danger is not the tumor itself, because surgeons can remove that, but the danger is that it spreads. So if lung cells spread to the brain, do you think that that's going to help the brain out? Does the brain need to really breathe? No. And then when these cells start growing, they're going to introduce disorder in your ordered brain, which is much the same as stabbing yourself in the head with an ice pick. Eventually, it's going to kill you uh, unless you can stop the lung cells from invading brain cells. And you can think about this with any other organ uh, that's critical. Uh, once it becomes disordered, it's not going to function properly. And so... That's definitely a part part of life. This is precise organization or order. Uh, another part of life, and you know, this is a complex definition, is you need to be able to take energy and use it. So, so number one would be order. Number 
number two is energy and there are two ways generally to make energy in living systems uh, you can do photosynthesis or you can do what we call respiration there's chapters on both of these so chapters 9 and 10 um, chapters 9 and 10 are going to talk about this and um, so if you do photosynthesis you're going to make ATP by using sunlight and if you do cellular respiration you're going to make ATP by using uh, sugars uh, and we're going to talk about this in chapter uh, 5 uh, all the different things that you can use for energy but all you have to do is look at a nutritional label so uh, the things on the nutritional label that have calories in them those are things that you're you can use uh, by combining your, the food that you eat with the oxygen that you breathe and that makes your energy currency which is adenosine triphosphate this is actually uh, so lately on the news you guys have probably heard about the Pfizer vaccine that they're using for COVID is an RNA vaccine well this is a this is one of the parts of RNA uh, this is the A's um, in, in RNA there's A's and G's and C's and U's and we'll talk about this in chapter uh, 16 and chapter 17 but anyway um, so this molecule this RNA molecule is actually what you use as energy you can think about it this way so um, you probably know that gasoline comes from crude oil um, and you also probably know that you cannot pour crude oil into your gas tank and make your car go so the crude oil has to be refined into something that your car can use and it's the same thing here so your food has to be refined into ATP in order for you to be able to use it as an energy source and we're gonna we'll cover this in chapter uh, 8 uh, when we talk about metabolism so um, anyway the both of these uh, energy sources allow you to do all of the work and functions that your body needs to survive and if you want to know how long you could exist without making ATP it's super easy all you have to do is hold your breath because if you don't breathe you wouldn't be able to do cellular respiration so that would stop your ATP production so to find out how important ATP is hold your breath and then um, once you run out of ATP you die uh, because you can't do the functions you need for life so this is we're going to talk about this like again like I said in chapters 9 and 10 um, the ability to respond to stimuli to respond to the environment so I mean obviously uh, if you're a plant you need to be able to respond to sunlight so plants generally grow towards the sun and you can do experiments with plants at home where you you know rotate the plant like let's say you planted a plant in a cup you can do this just go to Walmart get you some seeds put it in a cup and as you turn it um, you'll see that the plant it will grow towards the light source uh, because that's what it needs to make its energy and uh, other organisms need to be able to uh, get food in some way uh, and so there most organisms that don't use photosynthesis need to be able to move uh, in some way shape or form so that they can respond to the environment where that doesn't have any food or if it's too hot or if it's too cold or things like that so We'll talk about motility in that, but this is definitely another uh, definition of life. Uh, everyone that is listening to this, uh, you came from a single fertilized egg. Um, so, so, so you just respond to environment. Number four is growth and development. So everyone in here came from a single fertilized egg, a sperm, 
fertilized an egg, and that's what we call a zygote. Um, and that zygote, that single cell, uh, divided through a process called mitosis, which we will cover in chapter 12. And through my and th these, the sperm and the egg were created using meiosis, which we'll talk about in chapter 13. So these sex cells were created, um, sperm if you're male, uh, eggs if you're female. The fertilized egg is called a zygote, and then this single cell will divide a trillion times uh, and then you will be born and even after you're born you continue to grow so um, growth and development is also very important in living systems we don't know of any other things that don't do grow and develop um, the ability to reproduce um, so uh, you have to be able to reproduce either asexually or sexually, and we're going to talk about that in chapter 13 and chapter 12. So I'm just going to move to this side, and we'll have reproduce. And just remember, like, you can't just have one of these as being a definition of life. Like, my photocopier reproduces things, but is it alive? No. Um, you know, the the cave in Karchner grows. Is it alive? No. Uh, you know, I can get a photo cell to respond to sunlight. Hoover Dam makes energy. You know, all kinds of things that are man-made are ordered. So we can't just use one single definition here. Um, and then, and then uh, reproduction is important because we don't live forever. So if we lived forever, then we wouldn't really need the ability to reproduce um, if we were immortal, but we're not. And so uh, reproduction is an important part of biology. Now, there are uh, individuals that uh, claim that um, we've been given the ability to live forever. Um, and let's see if this is still available. Aid. And so, uh, Clone Aid is uh, a group of individuals. It's actually a religious group. They uh, they're called Raelians, and they believe that we were sent uh, information by uh, aliens millions of years ago to provide us with the ability to clone humans and so if we look at um, the services they provide uh, you can they will help you to clone yourself um, and you can fill out this form and they will uh, they will uh, so the way cloning works is you take a fertilized egg. So let's, you know, it, it, this is an easy task. You have to re remove an egg uh, and a sperm. You could do this for plants too, but it's got to be a fertilized egg, a zygote, a single-celled zygote. And what they do is they remove the nucleus. So they, they do what we call nuclear transfer which is pulling the nucleus out of the fertilized egg and um, so we have we have a fertilized egg the zygote and inside that egg is DNA so they they use a needle a long needle it's usually a glass rod that's been really stretched you know, if you heat up a, a piece of glass, a hollow glass rod, and you stretch it out, it gets really thin, and then you just snap it at the end, and, and then you have a point, and that's basically how this is done. And they remove the DNA, so they suck the DNA out, right? and then they take another cell, 
like a skin cell. So let's say I wanted to clone Michael Jordan. So I could just take one of Michael Jordan's skin cells that also contains DNA in it. And once I remove the DNA out of this fertilized egg, I put Michael Jordan's DNA inside this fertilized egg. Right? And the goal is to get this fertilized egg to divide that trillion times in order to make a baby Michael Jordan. And of course, I would train it to play basketball and uh, all that good stuff. Um, so that's how you would clone um, anything from a sheep to a dog to a cat. I mean, they've done it with dogs. They've done it with cats. Uh, and the Raelians claim that they've done it with humans. So uh, they take the eggs from a donor. They use the nuclear transfer. Uh, they impl so they actually ha the tricky step is that you need to this step pulling the DNA out and putting foreign DNA in really freaks out the zygote right so it it arrests cell division it stops its growth and development you have there are chemicals or there are uh, electrical devices that can stimulate this cell division again and they would do this in a petri dish and once it started dividing then they would implant it into a surrogate or they could implant it into a you know if it was if you were a female and you wanted to clone yourself they would just take some eggs from you uh, fertilize that with some sperm pull the dna out put your skin cell dna in it and then stimulate it to start dividing and then they would implant that embryo uh you know it'd be like a 10 celled embryo uh into your uterus and you could carry your own clone uh and then give birth to it and i know that this sounds scary but i'll tell you a little secret there are clones that walk among us you know what they're called identical twins so um, there's a moratorium on this, but the, the Raelians, um, have done that. And they, in fact, where we talked about products that you have to use to stimulate, uh, this, and I don't, I don't know why my images aren't coming up, but, uh, they actually have a, a, a cell fusion device that will, uh, allow this to the cells to start dividing by by uh basically electrically jolting it without to getting into the physics behind it and so uh you can actually buy this device from them and you know if you could extract eggs and fertilize them with sperm in a petri dish and pull the dna out and do all this stuff you could literally make your own clone in your garage I think the hardest part would be extracting uh, egg cells from a female, you know, because that's kind of a surgically invasive process. Uh, but the rest of it would be pretty straightforward. Um, you know, you could do in multiple ways. Uh, so anyway, uh, it's possible to clone humans. The Raelians say that they've done it. Uh, they won't provide any DNA evidence to that effect so we don't really know for sure but you know there are other people that have claimed to have done this too by by you know sailing ships in international waters and 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 uh, and you know doing these cloning experiments so who knows um, I wouldn't be surprised if it's been done okay so uh, we also need the ability to evolve, and that's called evolutionary adaptation. Now, I know a lot of people think that evolution is a dirty word, but but it's I think it's misunderstood. Evolution doesn't mean that we came from monkeys or anything like that. It just means that our genes, the percent of our genes in a population, so not this isn't individuals. This has got to be a, a group of individuals. Because one person couldn't evolve. It would, it's not like uh, Marvel uh, movies where all of a sudden you uh, sprout uh, adamantium claws or 
you uh, or wings come out of your back. Uh, it, evolution doesn't happen that way. It's really slow and gradual, and it really depends on a population. So, you know, you think about it this way. Let's say that uh, we have a population of blonde people and we have a population of brown haired people. And let's say that outside there's lots and lots of lions and tigers and bears, and they like to eat blonde haired people. Well, what do you think is going to happen to the blonde gene in the population? Let's say it's 50%. 50% of us are blonde and 50% of us are brown. And uh, lions and tigers and bears only like to eat blonde haired people. They don't like the taste of brown haired people. What's going to happen to the blonde haired people? Well, this number is going to go down, wouldn't it? And then if this number goes down because everything has to be 100%, this number is going to go up. And if they change, then they've evolved, right? So, I mean, you can look at like populations of Scandinavian people versus populations of African people and you're going to see the difference between the percent of hair color in there. So there's evolution going on between that and you know uh, you know we can this can be done naturally or this can be done artificially. Um, there's a thing called the secret life of dogs and you can look it up on YouTube or whatever. I'll show you a short clip of it later on when we talk about uh, population genetics and evolution which is you know way down the road there's a lab on this uh, and by the way um, in canvas in the discussion I need you to tell me if you have a bent or straight little finger and attach your free earlobe because uh, we're gonna need that data since we need a population right we can't do this on individuals in order to accomplish this lab and so I started it and I see a lot of you guys have already uh, chimed in on that. All right, so uh, back to what my original thought was, is that um, so so we have actually artificially uh, evolved dogs. So all dogs came from wolves, and you can you can see this in the Secret Life of Dogs. Uh, it's a PBS special. I don't I don't know if you can find it for free on the internet anymore, but you know see if you can find it somewhere it's a really a fascinating show um, and so so all the different species uh, chihuahuas and great danes all of those came from wolves um, and so does a chihuahua look like a wolf then it evolved does a great dane look like a wolf then it evolved right i mean really it doesn't even have to look like it it can just have different genes that you might not even be able to see and it's evolved and we're going to do a, an experiment to show that, you know, evolution is very real. It's not made up. Um, we know that because, you know, uh, we didn't magically get Chihuahuas and Great Danes. They came from wolves. And you can look at corn. So, you know, back in the days when the pilgrims were around, the corn looked like this. So it was mostly protein and you guys know what protein bars and protein ta shakes taste like. You know, they're not the most delicious thing ever. They're kind of taste like dirt. So back in the day when the pilgrims were here, the corn tasted like dirt. Today you would call that feed corn and sweet corn didn't exist until farmers started breeding they're like, oh, this corn's really sweet. Well, I'm going to breed this to other sweet corn. And in the end, what happened was, is that there's less and less protein and more carbs, which are sugars. And so obviously, as we decrease the amount of protein and increase the amount of carbs in corn, it's evolving and it's changing its flavor. And it turns out that 9 out of 10 people prefer sweet corn over dirt tasting corn uh, that's just a fact actually i just made that up uh so uh but i'm i'm sure it's probably close to being true all right the last thing is and the most important thing is the ability to regulate your internal environment um so i'm gonna erase some of this You guys can rewind it if you need to look at it again. That's kind of the beauty of this system. 
So if we look at homeostasis here, All right, so homeostasis is that um, you have to regulate a constant internal environment. So that basically means uh, the amount of water that you have inside your body and your cells, the uh, amount of sodium that you have inside your cells, the pH of your blood, the temperature of your cells. So all of these things have to be regulated. Um, I'll give you an example. So let's say that you had a really high temperature. Let's say it's 108 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, as a scientist, I would do Celsius, but I think it's too early. So we'll just wait on that. Uh, but, you know, let's say that this is like 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, so this temperature would denature your proteins inside your cell much like cracking an egg the egg white is albumin which is a protein and heating it up so you can think about it as making your protein solid so they wouldn't be able to move around inside the cell the fuse uh, and then they couldn't do their function anymore like make ATP and then in the end, the end result would be you'd be dead. Um, the same thing happens to the pH, and we'll talk. We're going to talk about this uh, in chapter three. Chapter three. Um, pH is really important too. pH stands for uh, the power of hydrogen. It's actually French. It's process, but that means power. So I just use power of hydrogen. Um, and there's a, a big trend, you know, of the of this alkaline water. Uh, so you want uh, uh, a high pH water. You know, I don't know, Gwyneth, Gwyneth Paltrow might have started this or something. A lot of celebrities do this. So you drink, you drink this high pH water and it's supposed to be really good for you. And it's supposed to change your pH. And this all came from scientists observing that if you increase the pH of cancer cells, then they die but in reality the truth is is because homeostasis is real that your pH of your blood has to be between 7.2 and 7.6 and if it goes outside of that the same thing that would happen if you had 108 fever would happen because pH can denature proteins as well and if it went outside of this you would also die so they noticed that changing the pH to high pH in cancer cells killed them. But the problem with that is that it also kills normal cells. So that's kind of a false uh, claim. It's almost the same as saying that, well, the increase of ice cream consumption uh, in Phoenix goes up in the summer and so does drownings. So eating ice cream causes you to drown. Um, or, you know, 99% of, uh, violent crime felons, uh, can, uh, uh, committed their crimes within 24 hours of eating bread. So bread makes you a violent criminal. Um, and we know that's, you know, just a coincidence. Same thing here. And, and the problem is, you, you know, uh, your kidneys, your kidneys, um, and again, we're not going to cover this in this class, but you will in anatomy and physiology. This is important. This is physiology. Um, your kidney's job is to make sure that it maintains this pH. So if you drink a lot of high pH water, you're going to, the kidneys are going to take all that, uh, alkalinity out and remove it. And what do your kidneys, uh, produce? Urine. And so you, you, you're going to pee that, uh, and you can pee it into a cup and you can test the pH and guess what? It's going to have a high pH because it's pulling out all of the things that cause you to have a high pH from the water and put it in your pee. So a lot of these celebrities will go, Oh, well test your pee 
and you'll see that it has a high uh, alkalinity and in reality duh it would but I defy them to test their blood and tell me that they have a high alkalinity in their blood because I know they couldn't otherwise they'd be dead so uh, this may be good for your teeth but it's certainly not going to affect your body um, and it's not going to cure cancer so anyway homeostasis is really 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 important uh, life is incredibly uh, fragile it's amazing that we're alive at all honestly uh, okay so with that said we've the sort of defined life and now uh, we're going to study it at its simple simplest level um, this class we're doing small so the simplest level for living this systems uh, that's capable of performing all of the activities of life, all of those seven things that we just talked about, is what we call the cell. So this, the some organisms have a single cell. Some organisms have are multicellular, like us, right? We have specialized cells. So we have brain cells and lung cells and kidney cells and so on and so forth. Some organisms are single cell. These are usually the bacteria uh, or the protists um, in fact that's well there are uh, so again yeast are single cell but they're not uh, they're not protists they're they're actually fungi they're the only example of a single cell uh, fungi because they're usually multi so the, this is my disclaimer uh, we're talking about millions and millions of different species of living systems and then some that we've never even discovered so in science we talk in great generalities uh there's there's always going to be the, an exception to the rule i got in a big discussion slash argument with students in my genetics class because i told them that uh i, well, I don't want to use too big of a terminology but I told them that eukaryotes aren't polycystronic, which means that they have one gene makes one protein. Where in bacteria, they have lots of genes uh, that are expressed at the same time. And then, so you can have one piece of RNA that makes multiple proteins. And they found one amoeba out of all the millions of species that had one gene in it that actually did this. And so, um, I had to sort of eat crow, uh, so to speak. So uh, when I tell you this sort of stuff, it's not 100% true. I mean, we don't know. That's why we say that their their theories or, uh, uh, you know, instead of everything is factual. So in the ex exception here of... Uh, an organism outside of the bacteria and protist would be uh, yeast in there and fungi, but they're single cell. Anyway, so that's my disclaimer. I'm sticking with it. Generally, 99, what I tell you is 99.999999% accurate, and there aren't any exceptions. Okay. So. One of your first test questions are going to be, who is the first person that named and described cells? Um, and that would be Robert Hooke. So make sure you know that name. I don't care about the dates. and I give you the dates, so you can kind of get an idea of how long ago this was. So, you know, we're, we're in uh, 2021. So, you know, this is uh, not terribly long ago. You know, like 300 and... Um, 46 years sorry 56 years so this is like 356 years ago um, that Robert Hooke uh, made this microscope it's called a compound microscope because it has uh, two lenses one is called the ocular uh, that's Latin for eye so the lens closest to your eye. The other one is the objective lens, and that is closest to the object, not 
Uh, anyway, that made me laugh. I'm not a hundred percent sure if that is or not, but um, there were people that were able to grind these lenses down. He actually built this microscope. It it uses an oil lamp and a flame that sort of focuses the light on here, and then the light uh, shines on this specimen, and then it goes through this mirror, this lens here, flips the image upside down, goes through this, and then flips it back up. And so that's why it's called a compound scope, and we can get pretty good magnification. This works a lot like a, like a periscope. You'd see a pirate using, you know, you, you slide it in and out, and that focuses it. And this is one of the first things that he saw. So he took a piece of cork from a wine bottle. You know, they're using wine back in the day, and he sliced it up, and he was like, I wonder what that looks like. And he saw these little boxes in here, and he called them cells because they thought they looked like prison cells. And that's literally how the word cell came to be. Um, and then this is a quote from his book, right? So this is the first time that he ever mentions uh, cells. So if I ask you to name the first person uh, to to name and describe cells, Robert Hooke is the correct answer. And it's from 1665. You don't need to know that date, just the person. This guy lived at the same time. His name is Lee Winhook. Um, he was actually the first person to see organisms in pond water and blood and sperm. Um, he used a different microscope called a simple microscope. It only has one lens. You can kind of think of this more as a magnifying glass. So you guys know the problem with a magnifying glass is when you try to make things too big, they get blurry. But Lee Winhook had a weird... Uh, eye condition where it his eye would correct the distortion that was made by the lens so um, he was able to see things that were much smaller uh, than uh, hook could so he could see uh, these blood cells which are quite small and uh, sperm cells which are quite small um, so if I ask you who's the first person to see uh, blood or sperm cells, the answer would be Leeward Hook. Um, Robert Hook actually, you know, like these guys knew each other. He tried to use Leeward Hook's microscope and he called it an abomination to his eye uh, because he couldn't see anything out of it. And he, he was quite skeptical about that. And so since most people don't have the uh, unusual eye condition. We don't normally use this microscope at all in the science laboratory. Uh, we do use uh, Hooke's uh, Hooke's compound microscope. Um, you know, in this semester, you guys won't be able to actually use a microscope since the class campus is closed. But in future classes that may see this video. Um, in the lab, we always use compound scopes, and that means it has two lenses, uh, one that's called the objective, closest to the object, one called the ocular, closest to your eye. All right. So these guys are the first ones to see cells, and people were like, wow, man, that's crazy. There's a whole different uh, ecosystem out there that we can't even see with our eye unless we have the special equipment it's almost like discovering stars for the first time or that there's stuff underneath the ocean and so they had parties like they had people would you know rich people would buy microscopes and they would have uh, parties where they would look at different junk and uh, you know these went on for years and in, in fact uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was actually written uh, based on these wild uh, written about these wild um, theories uh, on apologize, uh, our business phone uh, my wife's business phone my wife owns an escape room uh, so anyway uh, this uh, uh, 
Mary Shelley's book is written based on these wild fantasies of things that people had saw uh, using their these microscopes. So, you know, we're talking about um, these these guys lived in the you know mid to late 1600s, and so now we're talking about uh, you know 100 150 years or so people have been having these uh, microscope parties and looking at all this stuff. And then these guys, Sleeton and Swan, uh, they came along and they were like, you know what? Uh, all the stuff that I've looked at, all the literature, all the parties I've gone to, uh, every single one of those uh, that looked at living things, that all living things were made up of these cells that Robert Hooke had described, you know, 150 years earlier, roughly. And so they put uh, forth a theory that said that all living things are made out of cells. And so this is where that virus issue comes into because viruses are not cells. They can't do all of the, the things that are required for life that we defined earlier. So that would make viruses not alive if they fell on this definition but the counter to that is is that well you know viruses need other living things to exist well so do you because you can't do photosynthesis so without plants you'd be dead as well um so you know i mean you there's lots of interesting articles um written about this let me I'll, You know, so that so this is an article written in 2008, and it talks about our viruses alive. Um, I'm not sure you can get the full article here, but you can read part of it. Uh, and so it's kind of interesting the art, the proposals that are set forth, uh, whether or not viruses are or are not alive. If you were to ask me, I would say yes. Um, I'm interested in studying viruses, but, um, you know, I would say half scientists would tell you no, uh, which, you know, fair enough. Anyway, in 1855, this guy Virchow, he extended the cell theory to include the concept that all cells come from other cells. And so I'm going to ask you on the test, I might, 90%, uh, what's the cell theory? And the cell theory says that all living things are made up of cells, right? And the extended cell theory here. So I'm going to ask you what the extended cell theory is. I'm not going to ask you who did it, although you this might come in handy because somebody in the future might ask you. So it might not hurt you to know this. We do need to know Leeward Hook and Hook. Uh, you should know Sleeton and Swan, Virchow, that's, you know, if you have too much in your brain, you don't have to know that. Dates, like I said, they're not important. I'm just throwing them out there to let you know. So, you know, this is like 100, 175 years ago. Uh, this guy came up with a theory that said that all new cells come from existing cells. And this is kind of the concept of Jurassic Park. Right, so if you've seen Jurassic Park, you know that the scientists find DNA in these uh, insects and amber, and they take the DNA out of there and they basically clone it into uh, turtles and or alligators. I can't remember some reptile, and those hatch into T Rexes. So that. <coughs> um, that the author of Jurassic Park is a medical doctor and so he knows about biology and all this stuff I mean he had to have biology classes in order to do well in the MCAT to get into medical school and obviously graduate from medical school so he knows about this stuff and so he tried to make it as realistic as possible that this is really important because um, 
you cannot just create life out of nothingness you have to have an existing cell in order to start with um and so you know uh, a lot of people might be like okay yeah, well i can create life but they're lying because you can't do that unless you already have a pre-existing cell and so you know that that goes back to you know what came first the chicken or the egg and so on and so forth um we don't know of any organism that can create life out of just simple basic parts you have to have a functional cell in order to create life even if you took out the dna so uh this is this might be a little far-fetched because uh you know what are you going to use as the the fertilized egg to have the first cell to make a t-rex um uh, but what's my, maybe not so far-fetched is uh, woolly mammoths. So, you know, they dig up woolly mammoths all the time in Siberia. Um, I just read about, and, you know, and uh, Neanderthals too. So it would be possible to take a DNA out of a Neanderthal and put it into a human fertilized egg. You know, we talked about you pull out the DNA, add it in the Neanderthal DNA, get the cell to divide, implant it into a uterus and you have you know uh captain caveman uh you could also do that with the woolly mammoth so you could do the same thing maybe you could take an elephant egg take the dna out of the elephant egg add in the woolly mammoth dna put it into the uterus of uh, of um, an elephant and ta-da, they have a big tusk, right? So you would end up with a woolly mammoth. And Japanese scientists are actually trying to do this. So I can kind of show you this. Um, So you can read about the historical uh, significance of bringing back the woolly man uh, just by doing that, sort of that search there. Um, so you can see. No. That though. It's possible to take the DNA from a woolly mammoth and insert it into a fertilized elephant egg. All right, so I don't want you guys to know all of this information. I'm just giving you this as a timeline. Like I said, you need to know Robert Hook and Leeuwen Hook. It wouldn't have hurt to know Sleet and Swan, although I probably won't ask you that. And then Virchow, but. What I'm trying to give, get at is this timeline is relatively recent uh, that we've made these scientific discoveries. So biology is relatively a relatively new science. All right. So the things that we know about cells is that all cells are enclosed by a membrane. And so that's important, right? Because like, let's say you uh, had a house with no walls. Would you be able to regulate the internal environment of your house? The answer is no. And so the same thing with cells, right? We said cells have to maintain homeostasis. And to do that, they need uh, area to separate the inside from the outside. And so that um, is what we call a cell membrane. And we're going to talk about what it's made out of, but it's made out of fats. And the reason is, is because you probably know <coughs> a lot of this, a lot of you is made out of water and you wouldn't want to make your house out of something that's water soluble. Like if you made your walls out of paper and it rained, then they would all dissolve and you wouldn't be able to maintain homeostasis anymore. It'd be a terrible house. Same thing here. If you made your membrane out of something that was water soluble, and you drank water, then you wouldn't have a cell membrane anymore. 
You couldn't maintain homeostasis and you'd be dead. So, you, we all know that fats don't dissolve in water. And so that's the reason why cell membranes are made out of fats. We actually call them phospholipids. And I'll describe why that is in chapter 5. <clears throat> okay. All cells contain DNA. You probably know this already. Um, that's the heritable material that directs the cell's activity. So DNA is made into RNA and RNA is made into protein. We're going to, we'll talk about this later on in chapter 16, but this is what we call the central dogma of biology. And lately in the news, you probably heard about the Pfizer vaccine, which is an RNA vaccine, and the other vaccines. Um, I'm not sure who makes the pro. I think maybe this is Johnson and Johnson. Johnson and Johnson is makes the protein vaccine. So this is a traditional vaccine, and the Pfizer vaccine is the RNA vaccine. The reason that this is and we'll talk about this. The reason that the RNA uh, has to be, RNA is incredibly unstable. And so to make things more stable, it's the same reason that you put food in the refrigerator. It slows down the metabolism. It also slows down the metabolism of an enzyme called an RNase, which breaks down RNA. And they're all over the place. They're on your skin because a lot of viruses are made out of RNA. So the reason that that RNA vaccine has to be frozen, and you probably saw this on the news for COVID, is because it's made out of RNA, which is really unstable. Johnson & Johnson's is protein. This is much more stable. We'll talk about why later on. Um, but this doesn't have to be frozen. This is why it's more traditional. Uh, this has to be handled in a special way. But you're kind of cutting out the middleman if you're if you're doing uh, if you make RNA then you just tr get the cell to make the protein for you and this uh, is easier to get into the cell than this is so uh, that's why this vaccine was able to be produced so quickly as opposed to a protein vaccine but we'll talk about the differences and that's why we say that DNA is is just a book it's like a cookbook. It only directs cells' activities. It doesn't participate in them at all. Uh, just like a cookbook is not dinner, unless you like to eat paper. It's just the instruction manual of how to make dinner. And that, in, in the end, proteins are like dinner. All right. So there are two major kinds of cells, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. This comes from... Uh, Pro means before, karyote is nucleus, so prokaryotic cells literally mean before nucleus. U means true, karyote means nucleus, so eukaryotic cells literally mean true nucleus. So you can distinguish a prokaryote from eukaryote simply uh, uh, based on the fact of whether or not it has a nucleus. But there are other things that distinguish them as well. Um, all bacteria are prokaryotes and if we look at bacteria they're defined into two subgroups uh, they're called eubacteria which means true bacteria and archaeobacteria which something that's archaic is ancient both of those uh, all bacteria are prokaryotes um, archaeobacteria are kind of extremophiles if you think about like what you think of early earth to be really hot, uh, really crazy pHs, uh, real uh, real salty, uh, all of these really extreme environments. These are the, the archaeobacteria. So they live in like uh, hot springs in Yellowstone. Uh, they live in, in crazy pHs. They live in salt mines. Uh, they can live in, you know, we thought uh, these would be the bacteria we'd find under in Vostok. Uh, you know, really cold temperatures. Uh, they've even found archaeobacteria that have 
or they're alive on spent nuclear fuel rods. And so these are extremophiles. You bacteria, these are more of those tame bacteria that live in normal conditions. Like, like E. coli, for example, would be a U bacteria. You might not think of your colon as a hospitable environment, but it really is. I mean, it has a, a regular food supply. It has a, a nice regular thermoregulated temperature and pH and all that other stuff. So uh, E. coli bacteria found in your colon are actually U bacteria or true bacteria. Um, and these are very simple, right? Bacteria is the simplest form of life. All the other forms of life have more complex systems and they're eukaryotic cells. And there's some distinguishing features between them. Um, eukaryotic cells, uh, they have internal membranes and that, uh, we call organelles. So for example, uh, a eukaryote, one of the organelles in it would be the nucleus. And the nucleus would be the DNA, where that's where the DNA is kept and housed. It's kind of like the Mona Lisa. You don't, you only have one copy of your DNA, so you don't want to loan it out to your friends to go take to parties or whatever. Um, so you want a, a special compartment, just like they do with the Louvre and the Mona Lisa, in order to keep your DNA uh, safe from, you know, outside. Uh, want to be invaders or do batters or whatever you want to call them. Um, so that's a specialized organelle and, and only eukaryotes have these. There are other ones we'll, we'll talk about when we get to chapter six, mitochondria, uh, Golgi, uh, endoplasmic reticulum and, you know, all the typical cell stuff. So this here, down here is a eukaryotic cell and then this is a prokaryotic cell right here so you can see prokaryotes are small right they don't have specialized organelles like eukaryotes do there's none in here they don't have a nucleus that's why they're called prokaryotes um, if in a eukaryotic cell in the nucleus the dna combines with proteins these proteins are called histones, uh, and those form chromosomes. And actually, chroma means color, and some means uh, body. Uh, so the word chromosome actually comes from a stain that a scientist did, and when he added the stain on, he said, look at the colored parts. Of course, he said it in Latin, and that's where the word chromosomes came from. Uh, so... Uh, surrounding the nucleus is what we call a cytoplasm. It's also known as the cytosol. So these words mean the exact same thing. It's just like the word money. Or you can use dinero or moolah or bones or dice or cash or whatever, bucks. I mean, so yeah, uh, these are exactly the same word. They have the same meaning. Um, so the, this is a nucleus here. And the space between the nucleus and the cell membrane is called the cytoplasm or cytosol. All right. Um, some eukaryotic cells, like plants, have external cell walls. Um, and so that covers the eukaryotic cells. I'm going to stop here because it's about an hour, a little over an hour and 15 minutes that I've been recording this. Um, so that'll give us a good head start. And then... Uh, on Tuesday the 21st, uh, I'll pick this up, and obviously this is for spring 2021, so if yeah, future classes see this, the dates will be different, uh, just to let you know. So uh, anyway, um, I'm going to do live lecture on uh, Thursday uh, from 12.45 to 2. It's not mandatory. You don't have to attend it if you don't want to. Uh, it's available if you do. Um, just make sure if you want to remain anonymous that you log into Zoom with uh, your initials and don't turn on your video. Um, and then uh, don't say anything that you don't want to be out on the internet because I'm going to post this, these onto YouTube uh, eventually. So 
uh, that's it. And I'll see everyone uh, for the next lecture, which will be the continuation of chapter one. All right.